Hello and welcome. We are broadcasting this event from our studio located in the head office in Stockholm. Some weeks ago, we arranged a webinar on the German national strategy for hydrogen with an overview by the German energy agency DENA and presentations from top-notch companies. In light of the growing market opportunities for the German-Swedish business community, my colleague Nini Lövgren, who will also join us later today, called Hydrogen the New Black. And according to the Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal, Franz Timmermans, Hydrogen is the rock star of the energy system. In other words, most actors seem to agree that this certain chemical element will radically influence the energy system of the future. In today's session, our aim is to give you a follow-up, this time with a closer look at the Swedish national strategy for hydrogen. In this context, we also seek to discuss cross-sectoral collaborations and potential German-Swedish partnerships. We will also get a presentation of the much talked about hybrid project. And since we have an important substance, several distinguished guest speakers and a limited amount of time, I will try to keep it short. The Swedish national strategy for hydrogen will be presented in the beginning of next year. What can we expect? How and why is hydrogen our friend? And how does it fit in the bigger picture in Sweden's ambition to be the world's first fossil-free welfare state? I'm very happy to welcome the key figure, namely Svante Axelsson, who is the national coordinator of Fossil Free Sweden, Fossil Fritt Sverige, and together with the industry and the research institute RISE, the man behind the strategy. Svante, a very warm welcome. The screen is yours. Thank you. <coughs> nice to be part of this interesting event and seminar. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, we are now in progress to produce uh, the hydrogen strategy for fossil free Sweden. And we hope that also that will be the government's strategy. Uh, but first, I would say uh, I'm national coordinator of fossil free Sweden, as you mentioned. Uh, and it's not me that is fossil free, it's this different type of companies and, and local municipalities that support that Sweden want to be the first fossil free welfare nation in the world. It's a very, very strong support from many companies and local municipalities uh, for this strategy. And that's why now we're producing different roadmaps and also strategies. Uh, and we think we have changed uh, the logic, you can say, uh, we have changed the mindset in the debate, more or less, that we now see uh, fossil free as a, as a way to be more competitive. Uh, and also to increase the welfare in the whole society. And that's the opposite to the logic that you meet in different negotiation processes. So here we can see that we have a new new strategy in Sweden that we want to be uh, go faster because it's good for the economy, it's good for jobs, it's good for the welfare. And that's very, very hopeful that we now have an acceptance of that type of thoughts. Uh, as you mentioned, we also want to produce more uh, roadmaps, and we have produced so far 22, 22 different roadmaps uh, for fossil free competitiveness. Uh, and that's, we're very proud about that because if we talk about this process in other countries, they don't really believe that these branches and sectors voluntarily have produced these roadmaps and say it's good for the economy, it's good for the job. Uh, but they can can't do it themselves, so it needs two for a tango, or as we say now, we need a square dance. Uh, we need support from the local municipalities, from the consumer, from the government, and all different actors, if we want to manage this, this challenge to be the first fossil-free welfare nation. Uh, they are not waiting, they are doing something every day. Uh, so here we have some sort of uh, figures that show that what they are doing 
uh, in the first step. Uh, the, the domestic aviation want to be uh, fossil free 2030. Agriculture sector want to be fossil free 2030. Uh, the constructions need uh, want to reduce the emissions by 50% to 2030, and the construction uh, have more or less 20% of total uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So even others, uh, we have uh, concrete that want to reduce the, the emissions by 50% to 2023. So they are really step up now and, and the working is going very well. Uh, and we see uh, many, many local initiatives that take step by step to realize these different roadmaps. And we also see more strong decisions from the parliament uh, that make that, uh, that process much easier. And we cover more or less 70% uh, of all emissions by these 22 roadmaps. Uh, and we think we can manage it because now we have the, the concrete proposals, we have the map. Uh, so I'm very hopeful when you talk about the Swedish possibility to be the first fossil free welfare nation. And the challenges are different, but one is very, of course, the lack of biomass. Many different roadmaps want to use very lot of biomass. Uh, and that's why hydrogen is so interesting and so important, because we can't solve this puzzle uh, by using so much biomass. Uh, so that will be a very, very important issue for us in the future. And we will produce a strategy how we, will, how we can use the biomass in a more optimal way from the forest and from agriculture sector. And we need also very, very uh, to speed up the tempo when we talk about permissions and processes in the society as a whole. So after this 22 roadmaps, we want to solve the puzzle uh, because it's not easy to see that this could be combined to each other. We have conflicts between them, but also synergy effects. So now we are working with three different strategies. As I mentioned, uh, bio strategy. Uh, the first one was that we launched a strategy last week, uh, battery strategy. And now we are very, very uh, focused on the hydrogen strategy. So uh, what could I say about that? Uh, I can give you some thoughts of what we are thinking just now, but uh, we have to uh, wait uh, a month or something like that to see the concrete uh, strategy as a whole. And uh, of course, uh, it's very, very, I'm, I'm very uh, surprised myself to see how hydrogen could be uh, a key factor uh, when Sweden wants to be the fossil free nation. And I see also that you actually, uh, what actually enables a rapid introduction of hydrogen is, of course, reduced price on. Uh, nuclear uh, of, of uh, renewables and also of uh, uh, what say uh, high, uh, I got lost lost the name uh, electrolyzers of course yeah so the price is going down uh, of electrolyzers and renewables and that make it easier to see that green hydrogen co can compete with for example uh, natural gas something like 2030. Uh, and then that will change the whole play field if we have such a, a situation that green hydrogen could be more or less the same price as natural gas. And that also make it easier to say that the blue hydrogen is not so competitive in, in the long perspective because uh, then we need to have CCS at the same time as you also have the cost of natural gas. So in that situation, you can see that uh, the green hydrogen will be very competitive very, very rapidly. If we talk about different colors, uh, Sweden have a special situation, uh, and I, I, we have not decided yet how exactly how we, will, how we pronounce the differences, but uh, I think uh, in the short perspective, we accept more or less uh, all type of hydrogen as a bridge. Uh, when we talk about different colors, uh, blue, green, and pink. But in the medium long term, I think Sweden uh, 
more or less talk about fossil free hydrogen. And then we have a combination of renewable green hydrogen and pink hydrogen. And in the long term, in the long run, we only talk about green hydrogen. But uh, for Sweden, I think the fossil free hydrogen will be have a strong, uh, strong uh, role in this transition. When we then talk about uh, how we will uh, produce and uh, distribute this hydrogen, I don't think Sweden want to be part of the European backbone. Uh, we are focused now on uh, different uh, clusters and also use the value change in different parts of Sweden. Uh, we're not uh, sure about how we can combine uh, power cable and pipelines. But I think uh, if we see the learning curve, it's, it's not, uh, it's not, it's, it's uh, likely that the electrolyzers will be cheaper uh, for every day. And that will also make it uh, easier to see that we don't need so many pipelines, uh, but more of electrolyzers in different parts of Sweden. Finally, I can say we have a lot of uh, applications, of course, uh, in the short perspective, it's very, very uh, easy, you can say, to shift from grey hydrogen to, to fossil free hydrogen in Sweden. And that will, of course, be, be the first one. Uh, then we have a lot of huge industrial projects that Mikael will tell more about later. Uh, we talk about fossil free steel. We have also now heard about fossil free iron uh, and also, of course, uh, hydrogen we need to produce biodiesel, for example, in Prim in Lysoshil. So we have a lot of industrial projects that now need hydrogen. Uh, Svante, you just can... a short remark. Uh, we don't see any slides, so if you have something to show, okay, uh, you, you, have, you have to tell us. <laughs> but it's been interesting yes. enough anyways, but uh, if you have some slides you want to quickly run through to where you are now, please go ahead. You can, you can take the last one. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Yeah, yes. Uh, and then we, of course, can see how we can also produce uh, electric fuels uh, when we combine oxygen with hydrogen. Uh, and that will have a, a rather big potential in the long run to produce methanol. Aviation, you heard about Airbus, and they are producing a new aeroplane, 2035, they say, that could uh, be driven by uh, hydrogen. And even the agriculture sector is now looking for to produce fertilizer and nitrogen by uh, hydrogen. So we have a lot of uh, applications and that make it hopeful because we have, as I mentioned before, lack of biomass. Uh, and this make it uh, possible to uh, implement all these 22 roadmaps. So that's our thoughts just now when we talk about this hydrogen study. Thanks. Thank you very much for this uh, overview, uh, Svante. And uh, now it's time to let our other guests in. Uh, and we have invited representatives from highly interesting companies. And I say welcome to Mikael Norlander who is head of R&D portfolio, industry decarbonization at the hybrid project Vattenfall. We have Jenny Larfelt, who is a senior expert in combustion technology at Siemens Energy, and also a professor at Chalmers University in Gothenburg. And last but not least, Per Ek Dunge, who is the founder and vice president of PowerCell Sweden and also CEO PowerCell Germany. Let's start with you, Mikael, and some comments on Svante's presentations, please. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I have spent uh, quite some years now, since 2016, on hydrogen, and it's a very interesting topic indeed, especially put in its context. And to be frank, I'm a bit in catharsis mode, uh, since uh, it's not more than just half a year ago that I, I had a view that why would we even need a hydrogen strategy? Because hydrogen in itself is is known technology. I mean, the Norwegians started doing that, applying it large scale uh, already in the 1920s. So 
my take on, on hydrogen and its role is the focus of the value chain. I mean, still, what we're really talking about, uh, and this might sound obvious to come from a power company guy, um, is that what we're really talking about is a huge electrification project. I mean, as Svante said, um, the point with hydrogen is that um, why it's booming now, it's not really because of the electrolysis in the cell. Nothing magic happened to them recently, but rather the power going into the electrolysis has become cheap and green. We learn how to open the tap to renewables. So, so I think whatever strategy you make of this, it's important to have the start point and the end point of these value chains. Where does the energy come from? Um, and not forget that that underlying all of this is uh, the necessity of decarbonize the energy systems, which is an, an, uh, something that is already happening at a rapid pace. We know how to do that. Um, some of these um, electrons will go through electrolyzers and become hydrogen in order to replace fossil fuels in the user side. And I think when uh, there is a notion that that the steel industry and other um, heavy industry sectors and some of the heavy transports, you can bundle them together and call them hard to abate sectors. And they're really hard to abate because you have few alternatives. And even if we can, can produce loads of cheap green electricity, it doesn't fit. The square electricity doesn't fit around the holes of the industry. And then we need some tools in between. And hydrogen has proven to be an, an excellent means to achieve a lot of the decarbonization. So I think having, but, but important to say that is it doesn't solve everything. I mean, we have still some high and medium temperature applications. Um, we have some chemical processes or, or chemicals that we, we need to do. Um, and, and Svante also touched upon that the strategy deals with the, the conflict between hydrogen and um, biomass, which is really different ways to allocate our resources in the best way. I mean, clearly what we do, Sweden is a country of forests. We have 23 million hectares. Um, up here in the north where I live, you see hardly anything but trees. But Nevertheless, every hectare we have grows with only, on average, 10 megawatt hours per year. If you put windmills on the same site, you get lots more magnitudes more of energy from the same piece of land. And land will be important if we are to phase out on a global scale up to 80,000 plus terawatt hours of fossil fuels. So I think this is to, to, to get to the really to the image of what will a future society look like. And that I think has been, been done in an excellent manner in Fossil Free Sweden to, to put all these pieces of the puzzle together and kind of from a, a firm goal of 2045, backcast your way to what will this transition actually take. Then when you sum it all up, all the wish list, if you're a bit mean, you realize that, okay, this, this will be tough and we will in, uh, inevitably have conflicts. And that's why we need a strategy to see what role it will play in the value chain. Um, yeah, and, and then, then you don't need also to take every choices in this strategy. I mean, if you look at the infrastructure, electric, electrical grid versus gas grid, it might depend locally, regionally, it might depend on scale, it might depend on where you come from, what authorities are used to, and so on. Um, and this can also be applied differently depending on how much you scale up. Um, final comment is the market perspective. I think we talk about the, the basic industries here and we will see some, at least initially, some, some cost uh, increases. Uh, however, I think if you look at from a value chain perspective, these materials, the new green materials embedded in products will um, be less expensive than you think, because these basic materials will be diluted as they are refined into more valuable products. I mean, if you take steel and put it into a car, the cost of the car won't be that, that um, more expensive. And I think the the um, how you achieve, how you bridge this and how you keep the green attribute from the materials into the products will be 
in my view, more important than if we are five or 10% more or less um, expensive in cost. So, and that's, that's also where a strategy like this can, can help to shed light on how to achieve a market for green material. Because I think in the end, it's clearly a business case. Demand wants sustainable products, and we just need to breach the gap from basic industry to the final products. But I'm very eager to see where, where this leads and, and uh, share the work so far and very, very, um, we'll be very excited to read it early next year. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for this, Mikael. Uh, I hand over to you, Jenny, for some comments. Yes, thank you. So. Uh, I think hydrogen, I would like to make two comments in relation to hydrogen from the perspective I have uh, working in Finspong with uh, developing our gas turbines and turbo machinery um, in the R&D department. The, the first thing, uh, the, the recent interest for hydrogen has really uh, been uh, changing the situation for our gas turbines. If we deliver a gas turbine in combination with a steam turbine, similar like a site we have in Gothenburg, Ryya power plant, combined heat and power generation, uh, we would typically be running base load to produce power and heat um, uh, given the ambient condition uh, in winter, of course, more than in summer. But now with the shift to uh, green uh, renewable uh, electricity generation, wind and solar, uh, I think uh, it's clear to us that many of our gas turbine uh, plants uh, will not run uh, on a base load configuration, but rather in a much more flexible operation to support the wind and solar energy. And also, of course, we should run on green fuels so that the gas turbine becomes a part of the Renewable Energy Society. And one uh, very interesting topic is this power to X that you from green electricity produce uh, hydrogen and store this hydrogen and then use a fuel cell or a gas turbine to convert this hydrogen back to electricity. This is very often discussed and we get questions on when we have this 100% hydrogen turbine ready. But to my knowledge, it's very few that has this amount of green hydrogen available today. But my second point uh, is actually more to do with um, we started development uh, 10 years ago on co-firing with hydrogen and um, we have had historically turbines running with up to close 100% hydrogen of the older type where you use water injection or similar to suppress your NOx formation. But since 10 years, we have worked with our dry, low, uh, our pre-mixed combustion, low NOx combustion system. And uh, we are in a world lead position in our size range of gas turbines in being able to handle up to 60% by volume hydrogen in the fuel. And we recently sold two units to a, a, a chemical company in Brazil. And these... Uh, industrial turbine turbines we offer to chemical industries uh, refineries and and existing plants that uh, have hydrogen in a mixture with other hydrocarbons in their process and as a way of increasing efficiency in the power and heat generation on such a customer site we have uh, really put effort in being able to handle a wide uh, varying, varying fuel composition, uh, uh, although this is not, not green hydrogen. But now what we see is that this type of industry, refineries and chemical industries, and as Mikkel told about steel industry, of course, wants to transit also to have uh, sustainable products and green uh, manufacturing and production. And I'm very uh, eager or interested to see what will come out of this. And, and I'm not sure that the 100% hydrogen turbine 
uh, is the only product. Uh, I could still see that uh, our turbines can play a role in uh, also being able to handle uh, various hydrogen carriers like ammonia, methanol, that's also been discussed. Uh, so I see hydrogen together with such potential uh, hydrogen carriers coming. And uh, I think this Swedish strategy is, um, I, I'm not so sure I agree that blue hydrogen can't play a role, but hopefully just to um, keep momentum in being a uh, uh, world lead in, uh, in uh, hydrogen uh, capabilities and the, also for other industries to, for instance, in refineries producing biodiesels, the re requirement for hydrogen will increase. I think on the west coast of Sweden, uh, the needed uh, increase in hydrogen will be doubling uh, today's Swedish use of hydrogen. So somehow we have to solve this and be, uh, be uh, have R&D speed in what we do. To, because I think Sweden has a very strong position in uh, delivering environmental uh, good technology. So, uh, I, I, and I think this strategy is uh, very important to support us in industry to stay on the competitive edge, so to say. So, thank you. I say thank you, uh, Jenny, and uh, uh, give the word to Per, also representing a very important sector. So, I'm happy you're with us today, Per, and uh, please. So yeah, now I'm on mute. So yes, yeah, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me here to be able to talk about hydrogen and hydrogen strategies and how we see on that. And I'm also can say that I'm happy that we now have this Euro Swedish uh, hydrogen strategy or soon have it maybe, because uh, I mean, has have been involved in hydrogen for more than 30 years, actually doing uh, research on electrolyzer in working in Frankfurt in Germany, the Decima Institute in the late 80s. And since then, I've been in some way involved in hydrogen and fuel cells in different, in different companies and different positions. And I see, and I, already then I believed in hydrogen. And now I think the scope for hydrogen has even been much broader when you're looking into it now, because you can see hydrogen that that will be enable of this transition to a uh, fuel cell fry society. I mean, you can use the hydrogen as storing of the energy. When you produce a lot of renewable energy, you need to store it. Uh, and hydrogen is a very suitable for storage of huge amount of energy for longer time. Uh, you can um, have it in a, a buffer on the energy system. You can use it uh, for uh, transportation and distribution of energy, very large, huge amount. I mean, the, even if we don't have a good big uh, gas grid in, in Sweden, in Europe, there is a very big potential to produce, to transport energy much cheaper than you can do an electric grid by this way. Uh, you can also decarbonize the building and by using hydrogen for heating and electric power by fuel cells as feedstock in industries, which we heard, but also in the transportation sector where you really can decarbonize the sector and the heavy, heavy, heavy transportation and uh, marine application and different other applications where battery will not be en en enough. And the power cell as company uh, is a company completely devoted to hydrogen and fuel cell. We have not doing anything else since we was created in 2008 as a spin-off from AB Volvo to commercialize and further develop the technology would have been developed in the Volvo group for almost two decades. And since then we continue to develop and producing fuel cell stacks and system for different applications. So we are involved in on-road application, off-road application, marine application, also fuel cell for stationary application. And we even have uh, fuel cells in airplanes, but we have delivered. So we have delivered fuel cells to the first uh, fuel cell driven passenger airplane, which was uh, flying for uh, couple of months ago for the first time. So we're doing fuel cells for a few kilowatt up to many megawatt, which we are using in maritime application and also in uh, stationary application. And uh, I think that we will, it's uh, very good that power Sweden also enter into this activity. We have been involved very much in 
external project because there was no program in Sweden for hydrogen in the past. So we have been in European project and very many German projects. So we have a cooperation with Bosch where they have a license to producing our fuel cell for automotive application where we're using other application. We're working together with Audi, uh, BMW, Ford, Daimler and Volkswagen to develop the next generation fuel cell stack. And this is supported by the German government. So we have a big 80, 60 million euro project together there founded by the German, uh, German uh, state. And I see that that's very good. That's one to just point out that this green hydrogen, which is the future, because I think we are doing this to to get fossil fry and then we should have at least for the long term perspective that is green hydrogen which, which is it and i also think that it's important that we use the hydrogen in different application by fuel cells and gas turbine directly because to produce an electric fuel is will be much more more expensive and also very much lower efficiency you have to produce almost three times as much primary energy to using electric fuel than you have using the fuel in the fuel hydrogen in the fuel cell as such. So we were involved in this big uh, study to begin of this year, which McKinsey made uh, uh, with support from the Clean Sky uh, joint undertaking in the fuels and joint taking in Europe, which uh, Airbus referring to in their presentations when they was also we was all this and we were looking to different the fuel rate and we saw that hydrogen directly which be a much cheaper way to use and also that will be completely emission free if you combust it you will have NOx and other emissions so that is also I think is important but not only to support the technology development and scaling up because the cost will come down when we're scaling up the production we have seen that but we need to have some volume in hydrogen and production, fuel cell production to get to this cost that we will com be competitive with current technology. But we also need to look into regulation and standards to har harmonize them and take away barriers and obstacles for using hydrogen in different applications and also to demonstrate the safety of this application in domestic industrial application because I think this is important that we get an uh, acceptance for using this technology. For instance, when we or selling stack. We have some customer in Sweden which also have to look into the regulation standard to using hydrogen over the complete value chains from production, distribution, and end usage and storage. Thank you uh, very much, Per, uh, for this. We'll certainly come back to so, some of um, these points later on as well uh, in yeah, our discussion. A bit of my, my comments here. Uh, yeah, and we will certainly get back to many of these points. We have some questions here from my side and also many viewers. Uh, have sent some questions yep. I'll, and I'll try to fetch some of these and uh, ask them. But first we have the presentation from Nikel of the hybrid project. And the question here is, is Sweden's steel and iron industry facing a revolutionary shift? And maybe some words on the status of the project and any <coughs> lessons learned, experience drawn so far. And uh, the project receives a quite impressive media coverage. I guess you'll be happy about that as well. Um, but is it did also a potential export success? So some words on hybrid, Mikael, please. Yes, I think we on the speaker side was disconnected for a few seconds here, but I hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can. Perfect. So thanks. Uh, I'm very happy to give an update on the hybrid project. Um, just a short recap for the, those of you who might not know it. In 2016, uh, Swedish steel company SSAB, Swedish mining company LKB and ourselves, Vattenfall Power Company, started a cooperation with the purpose to replace the present process of making iron and steel uh, from virgin iron ore using coke in blast furnaces with a totally new route and instead using hydrogen from fossil free electricity. 
um, it's quite a drastic step and it's targeting to to um, um, make the entire value chain for steel making fossil free from the work to high uh, high quality steel if we succeed with this it will have a quite significant impact we will um, decrease the Swedish emissions by roughly 10 11 percent and if applied on a global scale it could potentially have the um, the impact of reducing up to 7% of global emissions. Um, and of course, as, as, as I briefly went into before, the, the underlying reason why this works now is that we finally have learned how to open the tap to renewable energy, um, which will be needed to, to a large extent for this, of course. Uh, we're talking about in, in the Swedish context that transforming the present production of steel in Sweden would need something like 15 terawatt hours or 10% of today's production. Two weeks ago, we heard an announcement from mining company LKAB, who produces about 90% of the domestic iron ore in European Union, that they would like to convert their, the iron production. So um, basically the full production of, of the iron ore in more or less in EU will um, be taking a route like this on hydrogen based. Um, and that would then mean that we need probably more than 50, five zero terawatt hours. Um, and we still think this is feasible, um, much because of the recent development that has been in, in um, energy generation. And there has, of course, Germany played a very pivotal role uh, with its development of wind and solar. Um, but also as, as a Swedish context here, we have already 98% fossil free power system in Sweden and very strong energy balance. So it's a good place to start where we have both the energy and the iron ore. Um, we have set up this project, we, we're running it in three phases. We did first the feasibility study to go through the entire value chain. Uh, confident from the results from that, we decided to start to roughly 150 million euro pilot phase where we have built different steps um, of, of the process in industrial scale. Uh, we're in the middle of that right now, but we're doing not things really sequentially here. We're doing it more in parallel. So we're already now preparing for uh, scaling up to demonstration plant. And by demonstration, we mean a million tons per year, which we aim to put in the market in 2026. Um, the little beauty you have behind me here is our pilot plant inaugurated in August this year in Lulio, a one ton per hour plant, so a pretty small one. And this is where we will learn how to make this in, in large scale, because as you all know, the devil is in the details. Next year, we will also um, start construction of a hydrogen storage, a pressurized hydrogen storage underground. Uh, which is a technology we see could work very well together with warm weather dependent power such as wind power and bridge the gap between the intermittence you have on the production side and the demand for steady supply of hydrogen. And if that technology works as we think, we have a tool where we basically can put a buffer of hydrogen in between the power system and the industry, which could be in the unit size of a capacity of roughly a million Tesla batteries. So huge thing and work in, uh, in a mode that fits with the temporal behavior of wind power. Um, we are somewhat a little surprised that despite COVID, we are um, according to plan roughly right now, just minor delays. Um, so we're proceeding and so far we're only encouraged. Uh, I was asked to, to make a few points on the lesson learned so far, and I, I put out three of those. First is that um, the cooperation between the industries and society at large, and the, the government, the um, authorities, research institute, and so is really key. I mean, this is a system transition, and we need we need to be. Uh, we need cooperation here. And I think not least the position of Svante and Fossil Free Sweden has been extremely good to, to have a smooth interface between politics and industry. We need to gradually build trust about this transition, both between the companies in the value chain, its new formations, but also, I mean, um, the politicians move when the industry moves. 
so so we need we need both to to build trust and understanding of what we need need by each other there um, and that goes basically for everything from um, financing we have great support we have 40 percent participation in the financing from our pilot phase uh, from the swedish energy authority and we also have very good discussions on how to change permission processes so we can speed up the the pace of the transition the second point is the demand side, uh, the fossil free steel will likely be slightly more uh, expensive from the beginning. Um, but I would say a, a, an experience is that it's a huge difference between how that is perceived by the market when you talk about it. When you act, things start happening. So demand moves when the industry moves. It's a totally different tone now when we, when we built the pilot plant, we show signs that this is actually coming. Then the game table changes a bit and they realize that, okay, if these guys get the first million ton of steel in the market, there are 1,799 million tons in the world market that is not fossil free. If you want to get your hands on the fossil free steel, wow, then it might be a competition for it even. But that leads me also to my last point. Uh, it is um, a tricky thing to get these value chains working to, to how do we define green steel? Um, how do we define a product that contains green steel? How do you couple the life cycle analysis for the different steps uh, of the value chain? So in the end, the consumer knows what they consume. That I think is a, a, a very crucial part of this because in the end, if we have markets for green products, then this will just ramble on. By itself that will make the transition desirable and not only necessary as, as Svante was into is the mood now of the industry and the case for it is really clear I mean energy transitions commission the London-based commission they calculated that transforming the entire hard to abate sectors globally might cost us about less than half a percent of global GDP whereas the Stern report, for those who remember it from 20, 2006, said that if we don't do anything and we destroy the climate, the financial risk of that is somewhere between 5 and 20% of global GDP. So we clearly have a business case. We just have to bridge it all the way to the customers to, to enable them to be a driving force in this. Thanks. Thank you very much for uh, this, Mikael. Um, Time flies when you're having fun, as you say, and uh, we still uh, have a lot to talk about. I'll try to pick up some questions from our viewers. And uh, Mikael, since you're warmed up now, I'll, you have to continue. Uh, I'll ask you two questions, and then I have one question for all of you, all our guests today. And that is, uh, where would you like us to be in two years from now? So you can keep that in mind, the other two of you. And Mikkel, we have a question from the Swedish Export Credit Agency, and that is if uh, CO2 emission, is that still a challenge uh, in the production of hydrogen? So that you can maybe answer quickly. And also an interesting question, if Hybrid has looked into uh, green hydrogen produced from waste. This question comes from Torsten Granberg, who is CEO at Plagazzi. So maybe those two questions, we start with you and I'll come to you in a second, Jenny. And please be quite short in answering these I'll questions, be brief. all of you. Thank yes. you. Um, when it comes to the CO2 footprint, as I said, we, we, we think in Sweden that we have a very good starting point given the, the power system context we operate in. Um, but I think, and maybe more from a European perspective, if we are to make, we are in the midst of a transition of the power system, but we know where that is heading already. Um, I think it would be unfortunate if we put our rules in such a way that we force ourselves to wait too long for the power system to be in place before we really start to decarbonize um, on, on the industry side using hydrogen from electricity. We are in a quite convenient position. I mean, in Sweden, it's hardly even a discussion about green hydrogen. Um, but I think in, in continental Europe, you will need, as the great philosopher Wayne Gretzky once said, uh, you have to go to where the puck will be and not, not do things in sequence because we simply don't have time. Um, the second question about the waste, 
I think there are in some cases low hanging fruits that you might use uh, where it fits into the system. I mean, it, it's not like we'll exclusively only see hydrogen from electricity, but I think this is also a matter of scale. If the cost is right and you're in the right place, then, then the hydrogen from waste or from biomass or from, from other sources um, could probably be used if it's, if it's deemed okay in this value chain. But I think if we're looking at this very large scale transformation, and again, London-based ETC looks at maybe 25,000 25, terawatt hours of hydrogen globally in, in mid-century, then I think basically electricity-based will take the major chunk of that. And where will we be in two years? That important last third question, Mikael. Where will we be in two years? Um, I, think speaking for, um, I think speaking for... Speaking for bad connection here, I think. Um, in two years, at least from the hybrid side, we hope to be in a position to take the final investment decision for a demonstration plant, which will be a major milestone in scaling up. So I, I hope that the cooperation leads us into um, being able to handle permission processes and so on, so that we actually get all the pieces together for an investment decision. And, we really can start moving on scaling up to, to commercial volumes. Thank you very much, uh, Mikael. And uh, Jenny, I have a quite technical question, uh, which also means that I'm quite happy that you are here to answer it, because uh, it's about uh, the underlying physics of hydrogen flashbacks. It comes from Mr. Alexis Bolin, who's an assistant professor at Delft University of Technology and if it would be useful to think about a possible design for an arresting mechanism that can help to prevent flashback in combustors operating on hydrogen fuels. Did you follow me? Yes, yes. Uh, flashback is the main challenge when using low NOx burners, and, uh, but we have developed our own uh, flashback prevention uh, system, a flashback out system to be proven, but uh, yes, we are interested in other solutions as well. So uh, that's interesting. And where do you hope to be in two years? If if I answer from a Swedish perspective, I mean, uh, as a gas turbine manufacturer, We uh, sell our turbines 99.9% abroad. So, but which, uh, where we would be in two years, uh, I think on the west coast of Sweden, to uh, somehow realize a demonstration where we demonstrate sector coupling uh, of hydrogen with the chemical industry and energy sector on the west coast of Sweden, and that in two years' time we have a pretty clear idea on, on how, uh, what we could demonstrate, and how. and uh, uh, such a demonstration, I think, should be world class, and I think we can do it uh, in Sweden if we join forces several companies. So that would be my dream. That sounds sounds good. And now one question to you as well, uh, Per. Uh, and I also want to mention we have received many more questions, but it's uh, not doable to. Uh, take it all in this session at least, but we'll certainly do more on hydrogen in the future, so um, we'll get back to you as well. Uh, I have a question here from uh, a man in the Swedish city, Växjö, runs a company and he is uh, certainly a supporter of hydrogen and he wants to know what do you think, how can we ensure that Swedish politicians on all levels realize the importance of hydrogen? and Big question, but please keep it brief if possible. Pad. Uh, sorry, I, I lost the connection. I didn't hear your last question. Uh, sorry, the I, question I lost is the connection. From a man from a company in the Swedish city of Växjö, 
and he wants to know how we can ensure that politicians on all levels realize the importance of hydrogen. So it's quite a big scope in this question, but if you can put it brief, I'll be happy. What is Yeah, needed? I think... Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, no, I think we have to work together here because I see that there's a very big potential and I think the interest really... Yeah, um, we have to work together here because I see that the potential of the interest really increased yes, increase last year here. I mean, we have for the Swedish hydrogen with something is uh, working on, which is a very important part, part of this. We, um, but we also have, to, we, I mean, uh, we, we as company have to. to inform about the technology, the possibility, and the, what we can do with it, and all that in, in this area. Uh, we, we also work with our uh, National Hydrogen Association, that was very good, to inform about hydrogen and potential possibilities. So I think we have to work on all levels, on the companies on the local level, and we are the organization, but also on the national le le level here. Thank you. Um, we have 10 minutes to 12, and it's time for a closing remarks by Svante Axelsson, and then I also want to uh, give the word to my colleague Nini Lövgren, who is Head of Market Entry and Business Development here at the Chamber, and also uh, Chief of our German-Swedish Tech Forum. But let's start with uh, you, Svante. You've been patiently listening now, not saying anything for some time. Do you have uh, any comments on the companies? presentations and comments on your presentation. So please give us a short summary of your impressions today and then we'll move on to Nini. Svante, please. You have to put on your microphone, Svante. No microphone. Uh, That's better. Should I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't catch the question, but I, I suppose I will summarize some impressions. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I think it's uh, it's very nice to hear the different uh, uh, experts here, and I uh, will stress that uh, Mikael said uh, how we can finance the transition, and I think it's very very interesting to hear about this value change argumentation, uh, and that it's so cheap for the consumer in the long run, and uh, that make it possible to make uh, a sort of business case if we talk about business uh, value change, but also. I think it's important for the state to support this first step because we we are looking for the learning curve. Uh, and that's why we perhaps also could talk about carbon contract, uh, con uh, carbon uh, co different uh, con contract because it, it's a way to reduce the cost in, in the first steps. But in the long run, it will be beneficial as itself. But I think now we, we need to step up and, and speed up to reduce the learning curves so it will be beneficial uh, without state support. Okay, wonderful. Uh, it's time to wrap it up a bit. Uh, and I introduced uh, Nini. Uh, and uh, what's your take, Nini, on today's session? And how can we support, the Chamber support, the German-Swedish business community in light of we've, what we've heard today? Please, Nini. Yeah, th thank you so much, uh, Vale. It's it's really inspiring discussion that we that we had, and of course, for for us from the uh, chamber side, it's it's also very nice to to hear the words like we have to cooperate and we have to act and work together to be smart and fast. That is of course something that is um, really really good to see because I think uh, also this session shows very clearly that. The area of hydrogen is uh, another possibility for even more German-Swedish collaboration, and that is, of course, fantastic. And and my thought was also that um, that we, as a facilitator and and also a, an operative partner for German-Swedish business, we could actually be one of those um, puzzle pieces, as you called it, uh, Svante or Mikael, in in your presentations, and we could focus on finding maybe the the concrete business opportunities or area areas where where german and swedish core competences could could match in in different areas both com when i think of companies and institutions for example to develop further together and to to boost uh, and to to speed up the um, uh, the development 
And um, since we work very pragmatic and result oriented, we, we assist both in, in matching on an individual basis. And, and that would be if, if you as a company would like to get in touch with a specific group of companies in, in the other country, in Sweden or Germany, uh, based on a concrete business profile, for example. But also we conduct market analysis uh, or other kinds of inputs for decision making processes when you enter the German or the Swedish market. Uh, for example, uh, also study trips um, that uh, include maybe speeches and study visits or interactive slots. And uh, we have done this uh, the last um, weeks and months actually also uh, digitally. So very uh, interesting to see that it also works out in the new formats. And in the field of energy that we touched today, uh, and that of course includes um, hydrogen uh, as, as well, uh, we would also like to mention our Swedish German clean tech platform. Um, that is a program financed by the Swedish Energy Agency, Energy Minierten. And uh, Per, you know that very well, uh, PowerCell is part of it uh, as well, for example. And through this program uh, that, by the way, also is part of the vision for Sweden having a 100% fossil free energy system, uh, we both enhance bilateral exchange uh, as a whole, but also help Swedish uh, SME companies within uh, the energy sector to enter the German market. So it's only that side that we assist within this program. And it's also focusing on partner brokerage and delegation trips to, to Germany. But um, since we saw that we have a lot of possibilities here from a German-Swedish perspective, I, I and we would love to see this session as a beginning of a, uh, of a dialogue uh, from you that have joined today, both you speakers, but also uh, all you watching this uh, webinar. So we would look forward to, to hear your questions and, and requests and, and see what we can uh, accelerate and facilitate from our side. So please stay in touch. Thank you very uh, much for uh, this, uh, Nini. And maybe one last question for you, Svante, as well, uh, in this context. If you see uh, promising opportunities for German, in German companies also to be part of the Swedish hydrogen wave, so to say, so maybe we can increase cooperation. Yes, of course, we can uh, work together. And I mean, EU as a whole is now focused on hydrogen as a family. And uh, Sweden and Germany could work very closely, especially, I think, about the heavy transport system and heavy trucks that we now see uh, Scania and, and also Volvo AB is uh, focused on this hydrogen concept. Uh, because now we have to choose which type of uh, system we need in EU. And if German decide anything, we know that others will follow. Uh, so in that case, uh, we can work together. But also in technology, we have so m many, many connections. And we don't only talk about value chains in Sweden, we also talk about value chains in, in the whole EU. Uh, and I think also we have a lot of money in uh, on the table from Sweden and also from the from the Germany. So there we can work together in innovation fund and all other funds now. We, we can also very, very uh, strongly work together because uh, the time is, is short. Thank you. Um, now it's really time to uh, end this uh, today's session. I uh, thank you for joining us, uh, our guests, guests today and also our many viewers. And this is certainly not the last we'll do on hydrogen. Uh, it goes on for us as well. And in the next phase of this series, uh, we will arrange uh, cross-sectoral roundtable discussions with different industry sectors. And these will be exclusively for member companies. Uh, so make sure that your company either is or becomes a member here in our club. And uh, until then, take care and stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you soon again.